air we breathe is under assault. Public health concerns are on the rise as record numbers of smog days due to ground level ozone, industrial and automotive particle emissions, as well as natural causes, have led to a significant decline in air quality. Studies have shown that as smog levels increase, so too do emergency hospital admissions for respiratory problems. In Ontario alone, the financial cost to the healthcare system and overall economy has been estimated at a staggering $1 billion per year. What's driving our research is we've seen the predictions that for every dollar spent on, on pollution control strategies now, we can save five to seven dollars or maybe even more on healthcare costs in the future. The Canadian Foundation for Climate and Atmospheric Sciences supports a host of research projects, all adding to the world's knowledge of global air pollution. At the University of Toronto, researchers examine which air pollution components are most prevalent in the city's atmosphere. We're using a CIFCAS funding to study the air we breathe. We're trying to figure out what causes poor air quality, what sources are contributing to it, whether they be local or regional or transporter, and how meteorology affects it as well. We're interested in particles. We're interested in the chemical composition of particles because they are one of the main contributors to poor air quality in urban situations. Dr. Evans and his team sample particle emissions as they occur. Individual pollution particles are vaporized by a laser analyzer to determine their exact chemical composition and place of origin. Every time that spectrum changes, it's a different particle. Data developed by Dr. Evans' studies are of direct benefit to another research group working just down the street at the Gage Occupational Environmental Health Institute. What we do here is challenge people with specific substances in the air pollution mix. Okay, we're closing up now. Over the last 30 years, Dr. Silverman and her colleagues have conducted pioneering research, demonstrating the link between breathing polluted air and adverse health effects, such as increases in blood pressure. Because Dr. Evans' lab analyzes the composition of the air, Researchers at the Gage Institute know the exact chemical structure of the pollution particles their human test subjects are breathing. I couldn't do my work without a collaboration with Dr. Evans and his group. Half a continent away, researchers at Simon Fraser University have taken particle analysis one step further. Research here involves the construction of complex synthetic particles to identify the effect certain chemical components have on lung tissues. We will be able to identify which particle types are the most significant in causing adverse health effects due to particulate air pollution. And through those studies, we'll be able to identify the emission sources and ideally suggest strategies that are rational to reduce those emissions. Researchers coat test slides with human lung cells and then place them in a custom-designed chamber. A single synthetically engineered particle is then deposited onto the cells, and data is gathered on how the lung cells react to the specific compounds on a cellular level. We've learned that when soot or carbon that comes out of the exhaust of a vehicle and endotoxin, which is on gram-negative bacteria, which are present worldwide, when those two components are combined, we get a very large response from human lung cells, a toxic response. Natural disasters also take their toll on air quality. Forest fires can be a global air quality catastrophe, but studying how smoke travels has sped the development of a new atmospheric modeling program at York University. It, the model is, I say it's, we call it multi-scale, it means multifaceted. You can actually, you have a global perspective, but you can look at it in detail in, a, in an urban or a, local, or a regional situation as well. The main computer room at York University hosts a bank of powerful computers that Dr. Jack McConnell and his team used to develop their new atmospheric model. The dark brown mass seen circulating on the screen is smoke from Alaskan forest fires. We have a tool, I think, which is uh, probably second to none that's out there. 
The Atmospheric Modeling Program has the power to predict the transport of airborne pollutants around the globe. So you can look at what's coming from China, what we are exporting to do Europe, what Europe is exporting to Asia, and also north-south, what northern hemisphere is affecting the southern hemisphere. In the Arctic, the effects of global air pollution are under close scrutiny. A five-hour flight north of Toronto leads to Eureka on Ellesmere Island, a mere 1,100 kilometers from the North Pole. Here at a unique facility called the Polar Environment Atmospheric Research Laboratory, researchers like Dr. Jim Drummond monitor changes in the polar atmosphere. The atmosphere in the, in the Arctic is, is a very extreme atmosphere compared to the one that we more normally meet down south, but it's very much connected to it. The Arctic is extremely sensitive to air pollution, which means Canada's most northern region acts as a kind of early warning system for global atmospheric change. If anything happens in the Arctic, it's going to have an influence at more southern latitudes where we live, and conversely, things that happen south are going to have a, an influence up here. And so it's as important to know what's happening in this high Arctic atmosphere as it is to know what's happening in the atmosphere of Toronto or Vancouver. A newly formed network with research teams in Vancouver and Montreal examines the flow of air around urban areas. Meteorological sensing equipment gathers data on wind direction, solar radiation, greenhouse gas emissions, and the heat generated by buildings. The data gathered about the boundary level atmosphere that is, the air between the ground and one kilometer above promises far-reaching benefits for enhanced local weather forecasting and air quality research. And so the implementation of this model will provide a better boundary layer representation that can then be used by more specific air quality models. So the representation of a city in the sense of trying to get air quality measurements is quite critical because uh, a lot of the emissions come from cities and certainly the majority of the users of air quality forecasts live in cities. Each one of these projects will help provide a clearer picture of the factors influencing air quality. Projects funded by the Canadian Foundation for Climate and Atmospheric Sciences also provide unique training opportunities for the next generation of atmospheric investigators. This has provided funding to allow the graduate students to come in and use all this wonderful instrumentation that we've managed to put in place through the CFI funding. So there's a nice synergy there between the CIFCAS funding, which is providing stipends for the graduate students, and the CFI funding, which provided the instruments. Because everyone has a specialty in a certain instrument, everyone is accountable for their instrument and is accountable for educating the rest of the group on that particular piece of equipment. So just that kind of team environment is really valuable, I think, and, and it's a good setup for getting out in industry or academia later on. As changes to the fragile Arctic have demonstrated, atmospheric studies aimed at better understanding the quality of the air we breathe are crucial in answering public health concerns. Somebody asked me once, you know, why should I study the atmosphere? And my answer is, well, just breathe in and breathe out and tell me, you know, whether that's a sensible question or not. We, we like having pristine environment. We like having clean air. And so, you know, if we want to have that, then we have to put the study in to find out how we're going to preserve the environment. So I would argue that this, this is basically a benefit to every single Canadian. When it comes to setting environmental policies, Canada can't rely solely on international science initiatives. Our national interest can best be served by committing to long-term atmospheric research programs here in Canada. Canadian scientists need to provide Canadians with a complete picture of global air quality and what that means for our future. <laughs>